like to invite our, our panelists to the stage now and welcome um, my partner in crime tonight, Todd Rockoff. And if you'll join me in giving a round of applause to Todd and his fabulous staff here at the Tucson J for their hospitality. Todd has supported AZPM over the years for a variety of these kind of screening events, and we certainly appreciate his friendship and his, his support. As Jack said, my name is Todd Rockoff, and I have the great honor and joy to be president and CEO here at the Tucson JCC. I am humbled to be joined here on stage this evening with Andrew Schott, a survivor of the Holocaust, Dr. Ed Wright, professor and director of Arizona Center for Judaic Studies, and Laurie Shepard, the executive director of the Tucson Jewish Museum and Holocaust Center. There are gonna be volunteers who are gonna be in the audience who will collect, or who you can raise your hand, excuse me, if you would like to write down a question to ask. They will hand you an index card, and when you are ready to have that picked up, please raise your hand again, and we will try to make some time um, before the end of our time together to answer some of your questions as well. Andrew, I'd like to start with you, if I may. As we saw at the beginning of tonight's film, Otto Frank described what it was like when the Germans invaded the Netherlands. You were nine years old in 1940 when this happened to you. You were forced to leave your school that you attended to attend a school for Jews only, where you met Anne and Margot Frank. Can you tell us what it was like to be on that day living as a typical nine-year-old boy and the next you are being removed from your school, separated from your peers, and virtually from your life? Well, the, the, the general feeling was total confusion. Uh, I had no idea what war was all about. My mom did. She was an adult during World War I. But uh, at, shortly afterwards, they made me wear the star. Uh, they issued those, two of those stars. We had to pay for them, but uh, one of those survived, and it is hanging in the museum. But um, the thing was total confusion, and fortunately in Holland, more so than in most European countries, we were not excluded by the general population. Yes, there were Nazis in Holland, but the general population of Holland was very supportive to the cause of the Jews. Thank you. Ed, if I may, historically speaking, what is the connection between anti-Semitism and the Holocaust? Sure. <clears throat> First of all, it's, it's great to be here. Um, thank you for the opportunity to join. Um, the, you know, what happens, you look historically. Uh, first, I ask myself, why are these people uh, whose homeland is in uh, the Levant, in the Eastern Mediterranean, in the Eastern Europe? And this began a process that started, this began with a process started with the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in 70 CE. Uh, eventually, the Roman Empire becomes Christian. And the, at the time, uh, I mean, we could go into some of the things about the New Testament. I, I won't do that. But there are some issues there. And what happens in the early Christian Empire is it's uh, Roman Empire as when it becomes Christian. Uh, the Christians find out while it's great to, um, you know, be the victor in that the uh, pin is mightier than the sword. It's always good to have a sword. And the what happened was they started in, uh, creating laws that restricted what Jews could do, what areas they could work in and where they could live and all this. So this starts early. It gets into the Middle Ages where anti-Semitism is, uh, how shall I put it, is, is rampant. The stories uh, that people would tell about, about uh, what Jews did, what Jews thought, and all this, uh, all these anti-Semitic tropes uh, about Jewish behavior and beliefs and, and physical appearance uh, is part of European culture. By the time we get to the 20th century now, uh, we see a, a Germany that had suffered under the results of the Treaty of Versailles after the First World War, and they're angry. They're, they suffer from the Depression as well. They are angry, and they find a victim again, and it's the Jewish community again. So what happens is this, 
this anti-Semitism uh, was then weaponized by the Third Reich, and the result was the Holocaust. So it is anti-Semitism unchecked uh, that led to the Holocaust in many respects. Thank you. Laurie, tonight in the movie, we learned that the racial laws in Nazi Germany that they had instituted were based on America's segregation era laws. Talk about how the Nuremberg laws and the Jim Crow laws were similar, and then where did they differ? So in 1935, um, Nazi Germany passed two racially discriminatory pieces of legislation that um, would come to be known as the Nuremberg Laws. They were the Reich Citizenship Law and the Law of Protection of German Blood and German Honor. The goal of both of these laws was to legally discriminate against and to, to be able to disenfranchise the Jewish community. But we know um, that these were not new ideas. So Nazis had long admired the um, Jim Crow laws of the American South and um, had studied them. They actually had sent Nazi jurists here to the United States to study those laws. Um, but one of the challenges that the, that the Nazi Nazi Germany found was that those laws actually didn't go far enough. So those laws looked at how do we um, keep people from doing things, how do we restrict people, but they didn't feel that they were going to oppress the, the German Jews enough because the Nazis said, well, in the United States, blacks are already poor and already oppressed, but their belief was that in Germany, Jews were um, already in, in control of things they didn't want them to be and of means. So they wanted to take the laws even further. They, so one of the things that they did was go further than looking at the Jim Crow laws of the South to looking at our federal laws. And in the United States, one of the federal laws that they really studied was the difference between citizenship and nationals. And this was a very important distinction for Nazi Germany as they looked to persecute because it allowed them to strip things away that were already there and already given. And um, the U.S. had been doing this in, in, many, in many ways with Native Americans, Filipinos, with any group that was um, from a territory that was a U.S. territory. So while they modeled the, the, some of the laws off Jim Crow, they also looked at our national, or excuse me, our federal laws um, for how, how we should do that. Another place that was really important was anti-miscegenation laws. Um, these were the laws that looked at not only how do you define race, but then how do you keep races apart. Um, and in the United States, they mentioned just a moment ago in the video, um, we had something um, referred to as the one drop doctrine or the one drop rule. And what that meant was that if you had one drop of black ancestry in your blood that left you as black. And in Germany, this was a little more complex. Um, in Europe, this didn't, this didn't go in the same capacity. So that's where the um, Nazis decided to adopt a lineage um, discussion of it. And so therefore it became that if you had three or more Jewish grandparents, then you were Jewish. Um, one of the things that I always find quite interesting is that this went against some of their own beliefs, their own teachings, because they, the argument was made that, that, that this was a race and, and you wanted to keep the Aryan blood pure. But when they used this, they used it from a cultural, uh, social, and religious standing. So how you determined who was Jewish was actually done through community records and um, not through literally the one drop rule in the blood. So um, it, it can actually be quite disheartening for us to consider that Jewish, uh, excuse me, that um, Nazi Germany created their hateful and disturbing jurisprudence from American canon law. But what's important about this, and we do discuss this, all of our docents will talk about this at the museum, is to look at 
how they examined the United States and how the United States played a role in that. If we're going to examine who we are today, we have to have the courage to look at who we were. And that's difficult at times. No, absolutely. And thank you for that answer. Andrew, if I can ask, when you did make it to the United States, you received an official looking letter. Can you tell us a little bit about, about that letter? Yeah. When I came, I was 19 years old. In fact, I turned 19 on the ship coming over. And uh, I didn't speak a word of English. And uh, found a little apartment, my mom and I, and I got a letter that looked very official. And I took it to my landlord, because he had been stationed in Germany, and he could speak some German, and I could speak a little German. And he opened the envelope and started laughing. He said, you've been drafted. <laughs> so I entered the Army in February 13, 1951. And I wasn't too happy about that. And the side story of that is it actually was one of the best things that could have happened to me because I was very angry still. The time in the camp uh, made me hate all Germans. And when I finished basic training, they were gonna send me to Germany. And I went to see my commander and I said, I really don't want to go to Germany. And he made an appointment for me to see a psychologist and I met with her and she took me to the regimental commander and she said, sir, I don't think it's wise to send this man to Germany with a loaded rifle. <laughs> <laughs> but then she worked with me after that and she told me that if you allow that maniac to run the rest of your life to tell you how to feel and how to act, he's won. What you need to do is get all of that hatred behind you and look at the future. And uh, that was a lot of help to me. That's wonderful, thank you. Lori, as we examine the United States and the Holocaust, a, an important question is, what did we know and when? It's a simple question. No. <laughs> um, American newspapers reported frequently on Hitler and Nazi Germany all throughout the 1930s. There was there were at least 2,000 uh, printed daily papers in the United States at that time, and almost every American received a subscription to at least one of them. Um, some, some households received subscriptions to multiples. Some, some um, also had radios, and there would be newsreels as well, but mainly newspapers were the bulk of our, our news at that time. So it is really hard to say that almost any American didn't know about Nazi persecution of the Jews throughout the 1930s. The articles had headlines with titles such as Nazi Party announces plans to boycott Jewish businesses. And um, German Jews denied citizenship. Um, Eisenhower, or not Eisenhower, pardon me, Einstein's bank accounts frozen. There were, there were articles that covered everything from opinions to international news. Um, by, the 1930, by 1933, tens of thousands of Americans had already signed petitions um, defending Jews' rights and calling for Nazi Germany to be sanctioned. So we know from those things that, 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 that people knew what was happening. In 1938, we excuse me, 1936, I, I bumped it up a couple of years. In 1936, we had open discussions in newspapers over whether we should be boycotting the Berlin Olympics. So we know that people knew, we know that the government knew, 
1938, we also um, were part of the Avion Conference, and that conference was 32 delegates from around the world who sat down to discuss what uh, uh, Roosevelt called the Jewish refugee crisis. So we know that our we know that American citizens knew. We know that our government knew what was happening. I think um, one of the things that Deborah Lipstadt said in in that piece a little bit earlier was, it beggars the imagination. Is it was such a challenge for us. So to give you a local perspective, by the time Kristallnacht happened in November of 1938, the Arizona Daily Star would go on to run 20 articles between November 8th, 1938, and December the 3rd, 1938, all about Crystal Knock and what was happening. So to argue that, it, that people didn't know, it's just not true. We know that we knew and we know that our government knew. By 1943, we knew that two million Jews had already been murdered. And by 1943, Jankarski sat with President Roosevelt, the State Department, and the War Department and gave firsthand accounts of all that was happening. So I know that there's a, a sentiment that Americans just didn't know, and I know there's a lot where we say we were shocked when we finally saw what was happening, and, and we were. That's true. We were shocked when we saw what was finally happening because we knew it. We just didn't know yet how to accept what we were hearing, seeing, and experiencing. Thank you, that's really, really powerful. Ed, what is the difference between the way racial laws were instituted in Germany, which was a totalitarian regime, versus a democracy such as the US? Well, first of all, I don't know how you all re reacted. I have a feeling, my feeling is that uh, um, you know, I'm obviously proud to be an American and very happy that I'm an American. Um, but I also know that we are, in all of this, we're not, you know, complicit in, in this. But we also failed to do all we could. And, uh, you know, there's some of that going on in our society today. Even. The difference uh, in... Uh, after 1933, after uh, the death of von Hindenburg and the burning of the Reichstag, Hitler is named Fuhrer, and you swear allegiance to Hitler. You don't swear allegiance. There's no constitution or anything like that. You swear allegiance to this man. And this man, we know, obviously we know what his ideology was. And people bought into it, and the military imposed it. It was part, it was the national... Um, a program. It's, um, it's something that what Deborah said was beggars the imagination. The um, on our side, uh, you know, obviously we have failed to live up to the ideals in our constitution. Some of the people who signed and wrote our constitution failed to live up to some of those values. Uh, they own slaves. So um, I this I'm looking forward. To, you gotta watch it all, right? And thank God for AZPM for bringing it to us. But you have to watch it all because I, I sense in what we've seen here and in the other parts that, that I've looked at, uh, that it's something for us to learn about the past and also to learn about the present. And we'd all be the better for it. And I encourage my four-year-old granddaughter to do it, but it's a little too much for her. But, uh, you know, the rest of my family will definitely be tuned in. So, Lori, despite a growing refugee crisis, public opinion here did not want to accept more immigrants into our country. What were the obstacle? What obstacles did the Jewish refugees face attempting to come here specifically? You know, in the in the screening that we just watched, they they did a bit of an opinion poll. I'm going to share a different one with you, which is a 1938 opinion poll showed that 94 percent of Americans disapproved of Nazi Germany's treatment of Jews. But that same poll had 71 percent say no to allowing refugees to immigrate to the United States. That that 
I, I'm going to have to keep going back to Deborah Lipstadt. I had no idea she was going to give us such a good quote when she said, it beggars the imagination. Um, in the early 1900s, millions of Europeans immigrated to the United States. In fact, we didn't have quotas at all. Um, we didn't have quotas until 1924. The Johnson-Reed Act, um, which is a lot of times just called the Immigration Act, actually instituted the quotas that we ended up working with during World War II and the years leading the refugee crisis leading up to that. And though the, that act was put in place specifically to keep out those who were considered undesirable. And those who were considered undesirable at that time in 1924, this was just after World War I and just as we're about to enter um, the Great Depression, were Asians, Jews, and Africans. And it left only a quota of 164,000 of those groups that could come in. Now, interestingly enough, and something we talk about a lot at the museum is at that time, we didn't actually have any immigration quotas or rules around immigration from North American or South American countries. And I always like to point that out and have that conversation with visitors because it's so different now. And I think it's very telling that we look at how different it was then for how different it is now. So in, in 1933, when Hitler was appointed chancellor, there was only 25,970 Jewish Germans who were allowed to immigrate. Unfortunately, because immigration was so expensive and the process so arduous, only 1260, 1,267 were able to immigrate that year. No one else could afford to. There were, there were about seven steps that were required to immigrate into the United States at that time. The first was you know, fairly simple. You, you, you had to get all of your paperwork in line, get everything together. Um, that could be everything from your birth certificate to passports. You um, then needed to have, you needed to fill out the paperwork. That was the process. Then you needed to have a sponsor in the United States. Usually that was a family member. Um, and it was one sponsor until the 1940s. And in 1941, you were required to have two sponsors. And those sponsors had to pledge that you would never be a financial burden on the United States, that they would take care of any burden. Um, after that, you had to... Um, you had to book your passage, which was very expensive, several thousand dollars per person, um, which was astronomical for most people. Then you had to go to the US consulate, meet with somebody at the embassy, and, and they had to declare that you were not only um, financially fit, but also that you, were, that you were physically fit and mentally fit to come to the United States. If you passed all of those things, if you, you were able to book passage and do all those things. You also needed your transit, your transit visas. Um, let's say you were, you were traveling through Portugal. You, you had to get through Spain. You needed all of that. It was expensive. If you did all of that and you were one of the lucky 25,000, then you could immigrate to the United States. But in 1941, that part we just talked about a moment ago, Germans made that impossible by taking away Jewish citizenship. Now you were a national, you didn't have a passport. So you can't even get past stage two, which is preparing all of your paperwork and bringing it forward. So the door is closed in that capacity. Those Jews who did flee Germany and got into other areas, they quickly got swept back up as, as Germany pushed across and um, took over new areas. So even those who did get away, who did flee, they ended up back in the exact same position. And as, the, as war took over in Europe, the consulates closed. So even those people who could have been helped by a consulate member, by a, a kind diplomat, ended up losing that opportunity. The doors all closed, just one by one. Nearly impossible situation. Andrew, I want to go back to your time in the Army. What were your thoughts, you know, when you were drafted and having to reconcile 
um, serving for a country who remained neutral at best at the beginning of the war, and at worst did little to condemn the uh, Nazi, the actions of the Nazi regime. Well, I, uh, the thing is, I didn't know any of this going on during the war. I was over there. I didn't know what, what the United States government involvement was, but um, I felt good serving in because I had an experience. I came out of the camp weighing 79 pounds, and then a couple of years after the war, a group of us, we took a tour to Belgium to visit the graveyards of the liberating armies. And as I stood there and looked at all of those graves, I made a statement that the guy that we had asked if he could record that. I looked at that and I said, you know, here lie thousands of brave men who gave their lives so I could live. And to me, that was more important than any negative actions or inactions that were taken. I stayed in the military for 25 years, and uh, I still feel proud of that. And my greatest thing about the United States, it's soldiers that died for me. Thank you, and thank you for that honest answer. Ed, how do we combat the anti-Semitism that can result in genocide today in our community? Wow. Wow. You get the easy questions. Oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks for looking out for me, Todd. Uh, That's why you're sitting so far away from me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you later. Um, how do we... The, the fact that we still have it the fact that we 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 have people who can march in in uh, Charlottesville and say Jews won't replace us, they'll attack synagogues even here in our own town. That will put uh, the stickers I saw on poles, and we had them around the university. Anti-Semitic stuff. Uh, friends who had anti-Semitic flyers put on the windshield wiper of their car. The fact that we still deal deals with is just it's. In, in our town, even in our town, and obviously the terrible things we've seen across our country. The first thing I would think of, and I, I view it in terms of the things I've had to deal with, is caution is the word. Caution. Be on the lookout for it. The people marching and doing crazy things and, and doing salutes and Nazi swastikas and all that stuff, that's obvious. The, the part that I see most often, I'll be honest with you, is... Uh, a student in a class will say something like, well, because I teach Jewish history, right? Well, Jews think, and all of a sudden I go, okay, here we go, right? Jews do, Jews think. And all Jews, like, okay, here we go again. And this is the key. You, you kind of let it go. And then you say, well, you know, I thank you for that statement. And I know people think like that. But do you know how others hear that? And I call that the anti-Semitism of ignorance. And all you need to do is throw a little light. Kindly throw light on it. And that's the process of, of educating somebody out of it, right? So be cautious to it. The next thing is legislation. We have, thanks to Alma, we have the uh, House bill, was it uh, 22, 24, 41 or whatever it is. You know the number. I don't. Okay. Thanks. But thanks for, but thanks for putting me on the spot like that. So, sorry. Well, we're sharing now. Um, so, um, Hernandez, one of our, our representatives, uh, got through our Senate a uh, bill on um, education, right? An education bill regarding anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. And it's important for our students, right? It's important for our students. My daughter went through schools here. And she... Uh, had to have a class. Bill was one of her uh, teachers in this thing. And to this day, she remembers what he said. So we owe all of you a great debt of thanks. And we're here. And we're here to make sure we're not going to forget the six million, 
we're definitely not going to forget you. And you're important to all of us. Um, so that, that, that legislation, uh, the United States uh, accepting the uh, working definition of anti-Semitism. Now, there are some things in there that I might have done differently, but overall that the State Department uh, has accepted that uh, is, is a good thing. So that's the, you know, the legislative part. The final one I would say is education, actual education. So how do we do that? We do it that f for your testimonies uh, with our students. That's an important aspect uh, in keeping that there. Uh, educating, um, you know, this kind of thing, right? That ACPM, the, the, the JCC, and all these organizations can get together and do this. This is important. Uh, I also think, and this is something, this is one of my things. Look, I'm not gonna be around forever. And probably the university would like me to go sooner than later, but uh, at least some people there. Um, and what happens is I want to see us create, because we have people teaching Holocaust um, and courses in Holocaust and on anti-Semitism, but there are faculty that, you know, those positions come and go through the course of decades to have a, an endowed chair in Holocaust studies. That's something I would like to see done while I'm here. Uh, at least, you know, at least get started. Those are not short-term projects, right? Those, that's a major financial involvement. So that once it's an endowed chair, it's here forever. It goes nowhere, right? And you, we bring in people who uh, can continue that tradition. So I think if that's the way to do it, it involves all of us as individuals. You're going to learn about this. You're going to feel bad. Uh, and you're also going to feel like, hey, you know, maybe we didn't do our best, but we can do better. We can do better. And, and maybe that's, you know, how we address it. And we should all strive to continue to day after day. Lori, we know that this is a complicated history. It's replete with missed opportunities to help, policy debacles, at times outright anti-Semitic actions. But what did America or individual Americans do right? It, it is fairly easy um, for us now to look back. Hindsight's quite easy, isn't it, um, on the vast destruction of lives that were lost in the Holocaust and see exactly what the U.S. and other countries did wrong. But it is important to take a moment and say, but what did we get right? Because we learn from both of those things. We learn from our mistakes and we learn from what went well. So I would point out that the United States, and I think that I think that I recall it being in, in this video, the United States did more than any other country to aid those refugees um, from persecution. Was it enough? No, we know it wasn't enough, but they did the most, we did the most of any country. The one of the things the US finally did right was the establishment of the War Refugee Board. Um, that didn't come until January 1944, and it came through an executive order by President Roosevelt, and it happened because Henry Morgenthau, who was the Secretary of the Treasury and the only Jewish member of the cabinet, he, he basically shamed President Roosevelt into doing it, and it was the right thing to do. And so it was created through an executive order and it was funded from the presidential um, expense fund also with some congressional appropriations. And it ended up saving tens of thousands of lives toward the end of the war that would not have been saved otherwise. So it might have felt like too little too late, but not to those tens of thousands of people who were saved. Um, it, established, it established us in that region um, and, and helped funnel money to nonprofits, um, organizations, and NGOs who were already there doing the work. And it also created um, a place for the U.S. to put a little bit of pressure on other countries to take refugees. And it made a huge difference in people's lives. Um, the the, the that, that board was, was, was imperative. And then later after the war, at the end of the war, the U.S. would go on to take the lead um, as it related to displaced persons. Um, the U.S. helped establish all of the work that was done with displaced persons. There was more than 2 million displaced Europeans 
um, 250 of those were Jews who were who were completely displaced after the war, and um, it, it wasn't it wasn't great. In fact, for a lot of people, the war ended, and they ended up in the exact same camps where they had been held, and sometimes they were in those camps with Nazis. And it was a very complex situation, and the United States came in and really made a huge difference in that. And it and it cannot be said enough. Eighty thousand um, Jews were able to immigrate during that time, and that made a huge difference. Um, individuals made a huge difference as well. Um, the, you're going to see when you when you watch this, you're going to see lots of individuals. Um, one that springs to my mind is Varian Fry. Um, he was an American journalist who, in 1933, um, 30 to 35, saw what was happening in Berlin, and came back to the United States. Brought 200 people of prominence together, and they created an emergency um, rescue committee. He went back into occupied France at that time, and um, I'll be honest, through legal and illegal means, saved about 2,000 um, persecuted individuals from the Nazi regime. He actually ended up parting ways with that committee because of his means of getting things done. Um, they, they wanted to distance themselves but later in life, um, he was not only awarded from the um, he was not only awarded honors from the French government and the U.S. government, but the USHMM, U.S. Holocaust Museum Memorial, um, gave him the Eisenhower Award, and he was the first American to be honored as righteous among nations um, by Yad Vashem. So I think there were there were a lot of opportunities for America to get it right, and once in a while we did. And I think, again, if we're going to take a really hard look at the things we did wrong, it's also worth it to take a good look at what we got right, because that's what we need to be doing going forward. And each of us can make a little bit of difference in every day if we stick to our convictions. So... Ed, I, before we get to some of the questions from the audience, just a simple question that probably requires a long answer. Can it happen again? Oh, my. You know, it can happen again. It, can't, it's, it happens now. It's happening now. Uh, one of the things, uh, I think, connecting with the education thing is preparing ourselves for it. I should also add that we have at the university a new training module for diversity, equity, and inclusion. In that, there is a, mo is a whole program that faculty, staff, and students are going to have to go through. Uh, if you're a faculty, staff, or student here, get ready. It's one of those training modules we have to do. I have several of them we have to do every year. And this one has a module on anti-Semitism. Thanks to the work of Michelle Blumenberg at Hillel, uh, and to some of the programming uh, competent uh, expertise of Professor Gil Rybach and David Graysboard, the that thing I think is going live in the next couple of months. So, I mean, that's kind of the thing that you you do to try to prevent it. Uh, like I said, it's going on now. You have what's going on with the Rohingya, uh, what's going on with the Uyghurs in China, with the Rohingya in. Uh, Burma, uh, uh, and um, then with the Uyghurs. Uh, think about the what happened with the Yazidis. Think about uh, the Kurds in uh, southern Turkey, northern Syria, Iraq, uh, all these kind of things. Uh, what's going on in Sudan and South Sudan? What's going on in Nigeria? This goes on. This goes on. And we, we can't forget, it. this is why it's so keen to keep this kind of education before people. Um, you know, it's always somewhere else, although we did tour people during Second World War, right? Um, don't even get into the slavery part. It goes on. And we have to continually refresh our minds, which this series will help do. It will be challenging, but I think, you know what, I was, as we were sitting here, what I was thinking, it's kind of like going to Yad Vashem. 
on the way in, you learn about all the people, you see the names of the people uh, who, were, who, were, who were saving Jews, who were doing some, the righteous Gentiles who were doing these things. And then you go through the museum. This is in Jerusalem. If you haven't been, someday you'll go. It's a good thing. As you go through the museum, it's it's as depressing as some of the images. Those images are hard for me. Um, it's really hard. But then you walk back out into the light again, and you have hope, right? We will face these kinds of things. It's going on, but there's hope because there's good people who will stand up, and our voices just need to get louder and louder and louder. And we are taught that, in fact, we are all responsible for one another. And if we take that responsibility seriously, we can work together um, to fight. And, and yet, I'm going to take a question from the audience. Um, as we sit here today, how do we compare what's going on with the Russian invasion of the Ukraine to the events of pre-World War II and the lead up to what became the Holocaust? And I'll let anyone, I just get to ask, so I'll let anyone. Again, Todd really did do well in this, didn't he, as moderator? <laughs> so, Ed, I have a feeling you're gonna have some things to say, but I, I'll start and then pass to you. As we look at um, what's happening today, actually the museum has a, uh, a piece called the Contemporary Human Rights Exhibit um, that was funded by um, Alan and Mary Ann Langer. And one of the goals of that is to always look contemporarily at what's happening and then take that through the lens of the Holocaust and, and try to understand it. So going up um, in the next week will be an exhibit titled War Crimes, The World is Watching. And what we will look at is war crimes since the end of World War II and of course, a big part of that will be what we're seeing happening today when we turn on our televisions. Um, just as we discussed, what did we know during the Holocaust? Well, we have to ask ourselves today, what do we know? And what do we feel comfortable turning an eye to and turning away from? So I think it, the question is a difficult one and, and the exhibit will end with a, a conversation about what can we as citizens of the world do? And sometimes that is as simple as educating ourselves. Sometimes it's as complicated as getting involved deeply politically. So you, we each have to decide where we are and what we can do, what each of us are able to do. Okay. How is... First of all, I have a, a, a solid rule. I never compare anything to the Holocaust or to Hitler uh, because these are sui generis, right? Uh, they're of the, all of their own order. And, um, but you can look at the reaction of the countries around. What did they do? They saw uh, Putin's moves and he justified them by saying, oh, these are Russian peoples, just like Hitler did. Right? He used the same kind of vocabulary about invading other countries. There are Germans there. And we're going to bring them in. And um, so these other countries, all of a sudden, they want to be in NATO. Right? So exactly what he did want to do, Dafka, that's what he, Dafka, sorry, it's the Hebrew. Uh, that's exactly what happened. Right? That's exactly what he, so he triggered his own thing he didn't want. So good for him. So I'm gonna, we're going to have time maybe for one or two more questions. What parallels do you see between the anti-immigrant sentiment, nationalism, and Holocaust denial now and then? I, I will. I'll, I'll start. You, you, you look at this stuff. You watch this. Did you see the people cheering? when all these anti-Semitic things were being said. Um, you know, we have segments of our society who, who are frankly anti-Semites. There's, there's no law against being a bigot. There's no law against being ignorant. There's no law. They can do those things. But we have to call it out. It's wrong. 
in every sense. It's wrong in every sense. And our voice has to be louder than, and our, and our votes have to be louder than that other nonsense. Um, you know, it's, uh, look, I grew up in Oregon. I know that Oregon, or the, North, the Oregon Territory, was founded as a whites-only area. There are places where, and somewhat in Oregon, but in Idaho, where there are groups called the, the Idaho Redoubt, who want to have a pure white area in Idaho. Like, these people are scary. Uh, so that it's around, and we have to be prepared to stand up against them. Uh, in our small individual ways, and then as uh, broad, broader societal ways. Todd, I, w I just want to add to that. As you asked that question, the first word that came to my mind was, what's the same? It's politics. And do we continue to say, well, it's politics, and, and so I'm going to vote this way, or I'm going to vote that way, or I'm going to allow that politician to, to do this because I realize that they're, they're trying to get reelected. Or one of the things that everyone said about Roosevelt was he was a consummate politician. He was. And a lot of the decisions that were made were politically motivated for, for the, the strength of, of one party over another. And so what I see today when we look at asylum seekers, when we look at refugees, is it's just politics as usual. And so I challenge all of us that it has to be more than politics. We have to be more. It has to be personal. It has to go to our moral court character when it gets down to it. We have to, we have to inculcate into our citizenry, into our children, moral character. And, uh, and that moral care, look, I'm obviously you can kind of guess where I come from as a university professor, right? Um, that moral character has to be able to include, especially when we're dealing with refugees and people in difficult situations. Uh, you know, this is a very big country, as the one uh, person said. Um, and we, we have to have the moral character to, to, to not focus just on ourselves, but what we can do for others, because our country always gets better from that. Um, think of what we lost and the people we lost and had we brought these people in, oh my God, um, right? There's, it's, it's down to our moral character. You know, I uh, took a course in world history and we had a professor there who was a psychologist and he said there are two human traits that one or the other or combined are the cause of all conflicts. One of them is greed, and the other one is prejudice. He said, if we stomp out those two, we can have peace. If we don't, we'll never have peace. And the best thing we can do is live our life as exemplary as we possibly can. Help each other, and don't be greedy. Yeah. And, you know, we had discrimination is actually an evolutionary trait. We in the early, early hominids had to distinguish between uh, that rabbit over there that I can eat and the lion over there that can eat me. That's discriminating between those things. But we eventually developed higher level thinking and we have to have our higher level thinking engaged here. Uh, the other we, we talked about othering people. And that's where some of this comes in. Once you other other people and make them so different from you, alien from you, evil from you, uh, all those things, the next step is that you dehumanize them. And once you've dehumanized someone, you can do anything because it's no different than a shovel. And that's what happens. And that leads to the Holocaust. That leads to these kind of problems. And it gets back to our moral character. And all of you tonight have done one thing. The next thing you can do is encourage others to watch the show when it's on and have them encourage others. Never doubt that a small group of people can change the world because it's the only thing that ever has. And I thank you all for joining us tonight and have a safe drive home.